This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. I've heard that the sense of smell can create very strong, memorable connections in the brain. And when you smell something again, it brings you back. Well, there's a smell that I hope I never smell again. But if I did, it would bring me back to when I was about 10 years old. And my family was living in the country of Norway, which is great for hiking. It's our first summer there. We would often just go out and spend an entire Saturday climbing to the top of some some But it seemed wherever we wherever we were, even in the most remote location, there were always sheep. There must not be too many natural predators for sheep in Norway because they just seemed to roam freely wherever you were. So there I was hiking along, and the breeze brought a terrible, terrible smell to my nostrils. And so what would you do if you're a 10-year-old boy? Well, you go see what it is. <laughs> Maybe you don't. Maybe you're, yeah. But I went and I looked. What is this terrible smell? It smelled like rotting. Just nastiness. And I peeked over this rock, and a little further down was an upside-down sheep. There were flies. But it was still twitching. I didn't stick around. I turned around in horror because this half dead, half-rotting sheep, which is disgusting. Now, who of us would give his life for that sheep? Who of us would then climb down the rock, pick up this disgusting mass of flesh, put it on our shoulders, and go home rejoicing? This is what Jesus is talking about when he gives us the picture of the good shepherd. It's a picture that we treasure, of course, but realize this is not a flattering picture. I'm sure pastors have pointed this out to you before, just how foolish or disgusting sheep can be but when Jesus gave his life for the sheep, there's, there's more the, to this picture than just the sheep part. And that's what you get in John chapter 10. Jesus was speaking to a group of people who were enemies of his sheep, and yet they were supposed to be his sheep. They were supposed to be those who knew about the Messiah's coming and would rejoice when he came, but they had turned aside these Pharisees, these leaders of the church who were angry with Jesus. In John chapter 10, it's because he's healed a blind man and they're upset about it. Jesus' words about being the good shepherd for his sheep are spoken to his enemies. Truth is, we're not always the sheep in this picture. Sometimes we are sheep who put on wolves' clothing. Yes, the wolves that Jesus pictures for us here are those who attack the flock. He protects the flock from the wolves. But when our sinful nature teams up with Satan... This is the role that we play in this picture. We can be dangerous 
the fellow sheep. When we sense weakness in others, the instinct of our sinful nature can take over. We smell blood, and our hunger for power and control can lead to violence, putting others down, whether with words or actions. There is this brute beast within us, which Satan wants to let loose for his goals of chaos and destruction. The other part of this picture are the hired hands that Jesus introduces us to in, uh, in verse 12. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. This picture of the hired hand is especially cutting to those of us who have been given considerable responsibility over God's flock. As parents, we are to care for and nurture those in our family. As a pastor, we're supposed to watch over God's people and share with them God's good gifts. So many of you here at this congregation support Christian education at a place like Northland. These are all good things, good responsibilities that God gives us, but when we view our position as something transactional, I'll do this and I'll get this, it ruins everything. If a pastor starts looking at his role as simply a job, well, then it quickly becomes graceless. And as we view the responsibilities that God has given us in life as just something we have to do, well, then it can hollow out the whole thing and, and make it rotten inside. We're supposed to be doing this out of love, but it's so easy for us to view our responsibilities to care for fellow sheep as an obligation. It takes the joy out of it. We sometimes even do this with that message that God puts into our hands, the message of Christ's unconditional forgiveness, his self-sacrificing love. We treat it as something that people need to earn from us before we share it. In these ways, we've all been bad shepherds hired hands, living our Christian callings without courage, without grace, ruining the opportunities that God has given us. Jesus says that as the good shepherd, he knows us. He knows his sheep. And that can be a scary thought as we think about the ways that we've wandered or taken on the role of the wolf or the hired hand. He knows what we're really like. But as he describes this knowing, he reveals it's a different kind of knowing. He is not out to get us to expose us for our sin. Instead, he likens it to how his father knows him and he knows the father. Jesus knows us with a knowing where there is no guilt, no shame, no sin that remains because he laid down his life for the sheep. In this knowing that Jesus has established between us and himself, there is perfect love, unity, and fellowship. That's what he means when he compares it to his relationship with the Father. From eternity, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit have been united and love one another, have shown us what love truly is, and we see it most of all when Jesus took our place. When he left his heavenly home 
to be our shepherd, not out of obligation, but out of pure love. He laid down his life for the sheep, and in doing so, took the place that we deserved under his father's wrath. We know what was taking place on Good Friday, on that cross. The, the unimaginable God forsaking his own son, why would he do that but only to bring you into his family? Jesus did this out of his own authority, out of his own willingness. He laid down his life. And so having completed that task, he took it up again. You know what happened on Easter. The good shepherd rose from the dead to prove that his mission was complete. And so now, your relationship with your fellow sheep is no longer a transactional one. You don't have to earn anything by the things that you do. You live in grace under the love of God. You know your good shepherd knows you fully with all your faults and all your sinfulness, and yet loves you. And so you can set aside all your self-interest, all you're, you're striving to prove yourself somehow to God or to others. And your life as one of his sheep is a life of freedom. In whatever you're calling in life, whether it's as a parent or a pastor or as a supporter of the work of the church, you can do so in joy and freedom. You have a fellowship with the good shepherd and your, fellow she- and your fellow sheep of his flock that will never end. God has brought us the, the sometimes sheep, the sometimes wolves, the sometimes hired hands into the fellowship of his family. And so it's good to be a sheep. That's now for you a badge of honor to be called a sheep. Although the world may look on you as lowly and and weak, the life of a Christian of simply following our good shepherd, total dependence on him is a great place to be. You're dependent on, on the one who is entirely dependable, whose promises to bring you to the streams of living water never fail. And so his life for you as a sheep now is one of service where you rejoice to bring others to those waters which have refreshed you, where you know true hope and eternal life are free. Your good shepherd has given his life for the sheep. Rejoice to follow him with your fellow Christians. This is the life he's prepared for you and promises you for eternity. Amen.